Welcome to Winning the Audition, a special series from Contrabass Conversations featuring advice from leaders in the field about preparing and executing auditions successfully. This series is drawn from interviews conducted with dozens of bassists from orchestras like the Philadelphia Orchestra, Boston Symphony, Cleveland Orchestra, National Symphony, Chicago Symphony, and Houston Symphony, plus some of the major pedagogues in the field. This series provides actionable advice that you can use to take your auditioning to the next level. And while we're speaking with bassists for these episodes, this advice can certainly be applied to other instruments and disciplines as well. Our topic for this episode is practicing techniques for peak auditions. We're diving into practice methods that have worked well for many people. How we prepare for an audition has a tremendous impact on our confidence, going in to the audition and the results that we get. Brandon McLean of the Pittsburgh Symphony has this to say about preparation and the concept of having a good day in an audition. You know, when I wasn't doing well in auditions, the fact is, you know, I had lost those auditions months in advance, really, just because my preparation wasn't there, wasn't there good enough to win the audition. And it, you know, even if I had the best day of playing in my life, I think somebody that was more prepared having just a mediocre day could probably still be better at the audition than I did. Cincinnati Symphony principal bassist Owen Lee makes it crystal clear what he's looking for when listening to auditions. Play in tune and play in rhythm. Play the dynamics that are on the page, you know. Play what's written on the page, you know, the dynamics, the nuances, articulations. And then play with a good tone. If you can do all that, you'll make the finals easily if you can do those things. Chicago Symphony bassist Michael Hovnanian has a great perspective on this also. Most of the time, the things that eliminate people are, are so simple. Just the rhythm wasn't right, you know, the, the intonation or something that they ought to be able to hear themselves. It's not that like, oh, they didn't blow us away so they didn't get the job. It's really, oh, they didn't count, mm-hmm. you know, or they rushed or they dragged or it was out of tune. You know, some real basic It sounds so simple. Play in time, play in tune, play what's on the page. So why don't we all do that? Ed Barker, principal bassist of the Boston Symphony, sums it up well. My experience with students has been is that they they vastly underestimate how much practice it takes to accomplish this sort of thing, especially when you're preparing for something as nerve-wracking as an audition. And, and they'll often say, yes, no, I understand. And they, you know, I'll point it out to them and I'll even make, I'll draw diagrams and lessons and things and this is what you need to do. And they shake their head, yes. And then they go play the audition and they come back and they say, I vastly underestimated how much practice it takes. <laughs> Well, I'd like to take a moment and tell you about our sponsor, Discover Double Bass. And I'm so grateful for them sponsoring this series. They've got a video course on bowing technique with Lauren Pierce, and it's divided into 37 HD lessons. You can visit discoverdoublebass.com slash store, and you can watch Lauren give an overview of the three categories that these videos cover. They're basics, bow control, and real world techniques. And you also get free membership in the Discover Double Bass study group, where you can ask Lauren and Discover Double Bass founder Jeff Chalmers questions and get the help you need. You can check out more details and other great content at discoverdoublebass.com. So what specific techniques do people use in their audition preparation that work? Let's start with slow practice. Now, most of us are probably practicing slowly already, but it's interesting to hear just how far many successful audition takers go with this technique. Andy Rossiti of the Milwaukee Symphony describes the benefits of slow practice quite eloquently. One thing I learned over time was that playing things at half tempo is a really amazing way to get very, I would say, intimate with each move mm-hmm. in any particular excerpt. If we're talking excerpts here. What I soon learned was that when I put things at half tempo, I had to make sure that I wasn't practicing different moves than what would happen at live tempo, real tempo. I had to make sure I wasn't using more bow or I wasn't using a a, a slower bow or anything. Um, I was increasing the gap between each move, Mm -hmm. kind of practicing in slow motion. That was a big way to get some of this stuff to stand up when you get under pressure. When you've gotten used to 
observing something in slow motion and relaxed and, and very precise, you're telling your body over and over again, this is what it feels like to play this stuff. I think that our bodies don't really remember speed of something so much as their place in space and time. So if you play with your body in the right place and at the right rate, it's like watching sprinters practicing getting out of the block. They do it really slow because they want to see, oh, my elbow kicked out a little bit. That's going to take, that's going to add a microsecond to my time. Their body remembers the position more than it does the speed. And so that, that was a big breakthrough as far as being able to sit down and play. And even though I was playing faster, in my mind, I still felt like it was slower and relaxed. And I had the space, you know, that hyper awareness that you feel in an audition that often would, feels like a detriment. Oh my God, I just heard, oh, you know, you're aware of every, every time you blink yeah. and oh my God, the, the, the hair on the, on the string moved a little bit and I hear, you know, it's, it changes it from that kind of panicked, uncomfortable feeling to this extra space that you can sit in and I don't know, whatever the zone or the flow and you actually have space to phrase or to, mm-hmm. to feel this gesture and to hear this crescendo and all this stuff. And it's very, it's very liberating. It's a good place to be. Our bodies don't remember speed so much as their place in time. What a great concept, and what a great way to reframe that hyper-awareness that comes over people in auditions. National Symphony bassist Ira Gold talks about what he focuses on in his slow practice. I like to sometimes start from the beginning and start working on pieces that I've played ten times, but start working on them as if they're the first time, and go back to the beginning and play them really slowly, and make sure that... Again, I'm being honest about what I'm doing. And for me, I have to do that because if I don't, I'll just always feel like I'm just sort of ignoring the the growth process. So, you know, I'll start working on, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony slowly just to make sure I, you know, re-familiarize myself with the key signature, make sure the bow strokes are there, make sure I'm, you know, not playing messy. And Ian Hallis, the newest member of the Lyric Opera of Chicago Bass Section, goes into great detail about how he uses slow practice through the audition prep process. Here, take the first one in Mozart 40. You know, I like to play that around half note, 104-ish. I would be below 50 to start with that excerpt for for this particular example. So it's pretty unrecognizable. And you're just at that point, you're getting into the mechanics of everything. You know, is it in tune? But more importantly, do you know what you're going to accomplish by the end? You want to always have a clear map to where you're going with the excerpts. So, and that, like I said before, that was something I think I was missing up until recently. So I want to hear the shape that I want to make, even if it's at an unrecognizable tempo, because as you get it closer to tempo, it's actually going to be easier to make those shapes because they're more organic. The first day of my prep, I'm going to put the metronome 160 and play each note of that list at 60. So just one note per second of the entire list. The entire list, each note at 60. Wow. We'll hear more about Ian's routine on future episodes, but you can get an idea of how seriously many successful audition takers are about their slow practice. Another thing that successful audition takers do is record themselves. Renan Meyer from Time for Three talks about the massive gains in quality a former student experienced once he started taping himself. You can record yourself and listen back. I think that's a huge thing. I just had a student recently the other day. A uh, great student has really been coming on. His name's Brent Edmondson. He goes to the Temple now, studies with Rob Kesselman. And uh, he used to work with me some. We used to work together. And, uh, and he... Uh, he said that he just started recording himself a week ago. And before he said that, I was complimenting him profusely because I was so blown away with how far he, he came in two or three lessons. I was working with him at the summer camp that I teach with Hal Robinson. And, and I said, man, what have you been doing? This is incredible. And he said, well, I just started recording myself a week ago. So recording can bring about significant gains. Ira Gold places a high priority on recording as well. If I have the opportunity to to set aside some time to record myself, I'll do that too. Um, that way I can go back and listen to it and decide if, you know, if it's, if what I'm hearing on the recording matches what I'm hearing when I'm actually playing. Sometimes those two things don't match up. 
Think back to those simple concepts that Owen Lee and Michael Hovnanian mentioned. Are you playing in tune? Are you playing in time? Are you playing what's on the page? That's what a recording will reveal. Ian Hallis even records himself while under tempo. I started recording while things were still under tempo. Mm. So I think about a week before I started my run through, I was recording, let's say, um, there's a Marriage of Figaro excerpt where the performance tempo is around 126 to 132 to the half bar. So I was around 104. And I was recording that just to make sure everything was lining up, that I wasn't rushing things, that the general shapes that I wanted to make were there, like certain tapers of notes and releases of notes. And, you know, I, I have the notes. I, I made notes every single time. I would listen to it every single night and make notes on what I wanted to work on for the next day. And they're pretty, they're, they're, it was very helpful to see where things were going so that way you don't have everything at tempo and just record it and then be surprised by the way some things sound. So you catch it at a certain level where you know how things are going to sound because they're slow enough, you're still in complete control because you're not necessarily familiar with the way that everything is going. And then you can catch it and just kind of ride it as things hit tempo and then you start running through and you work on consistency alone. Okay, slow practice and recording. Two very important techniques that practically everyone uses. Yet, as Ed Barker mentioned, most people vastly underestimate the amount of time actually needed to achieve mastery. How you approach these moments in the practice room and the ways in which your mind is engaged are critical. Chicago Symphony principal bassist Alex Hanna shares his thoughts on practicing for auditions. In the practice room, you should make every effort to perform all the time you know the word practice kind of has a mindless connotation for a lot of people which I think is really bad Um, this is actually a a kind of a Bud Herseth quote you know the never practice always perform Mm -hmm. Uh, my piano teacher used to tell me this too when I would sometimes come into a lesson and play something a little uninspired Uh, she said that I had a musical button and so she would just push my musical button and you know it's kind of that thing where like you engage and you start to maybe it's like a right brain left brain thing but you always want to have that button turned on whether you're playing scales and samandal or you're playing the kuzovitsky concerto you want to be performing all the time you know breaking your practice up into smaller chunks is really effective I love David Moore's idea of, I think he recommends like 50 minute uh, practice sessions. You know, uh, you can even set a timer. I think that's a really great number. We'll cover more details about how various players break up their practice time later in this series. There are a variety of methods that people find effective. Michigan State University bass professor Jack Boudreau has a great technique for establishing tempo recall for excerpts. I give metronome markings for every excerpt. And then after students learn the excerpts and they're playing them, I ask them every day when you get up, I want you to play the excerpt, and then I want you to turn on the metronome to see how close you could get to this tempo. And then practice for just a few minutes with the metronome on and then practice that excerpt a few minutes with the metronome off. I think the recall is good because a lot of times People get into auditions, and they get the adrenaline going, and they try to play too fast. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, they try to play too slow. So the the recall of the actual tempo is pivotal, so that you know before you start playing exactly how how fast it's going to be. Brandon McLean found that his audition-taking skills got more solid as he started to practice in larger spaces. Some of the more helpful things for me has been, um, it was relatively late in life, I feel like, that I really got to spend time, a significant amount of time by myself in a large space in like a concert hall practicing. I had been a a real practice room practicer for a long time. And my concept of sound was based on the fact that, you know, things were bouncing back to me from three feet away as opposed to 300 feet away or, or more in a concert hall. So a really helpful thing for me was getting into big halls and putting a microphone a long ways away from me and realizing what I actually sounded like to the people that were listening on the panel a long ways away from me. 
One of the more helpful things for me has been getting over the idea that I don't really know what I sound like just from listening through my own ears. I guess it's similar to the way that uh, the way that you hear your own voice whenever you hear your voice back on tape. It's like, this doesn't sound at all like me, <laughs> but it's because <laughs> you're listening to your own voice through all these bones and muscles and all these things that are changing the way you're hearing your own voice as opposed to the way other people are hearing. And it's the same way with bass playing. The angle that you're listening to yourself playing the bass, nobody else is hearing at that angle. You know, you're above the thing. You're nowhere. The F holes are close to you, but they're not pointed at you. And you're moving around a bunch and you're doing all these things that are getting in the way of really hearing yourself. So I got really serious about recording myself. And I think that was when things started to turn a little bit for me, when I really got a sense of what I was doing that made a difference to the actual listener. What are you doing that can actually be heard by the listener? That's a great way to approach recording. Speaking of what can actually be heard by the listener, Jack Boudreau advocates going for different sounds for each composer. I don't agree that sound should be one sound at all. I, I think that's the part of the style differences between composers. It's uh, You have a Mozart sound, then you have a Beethoven sound, and then the Brahms sound is a little different from that. And they're all, they're all a little bit unique. Conductors love that. I know this sounds ridiculous, but occasionally I ask my students, I say, now, play this Beethoven excerpt as if it were Mozart. How would it sound? Mm. And then I'll say, let me hear this uh, Beethoven excerpt as if it were Brahms, and how that would sound. And make them go from one style to another, uh, playing the same music, just so they, they stay flexible and they understand that this is really what Mozart sounds like, even though Beethoven wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it helps them stay flexible. Stylistic flexibility and having a different sound for different composers is valuable food for thought. Jack also talks about note lengths and how they should relate to each other. Another thing I feel is important is the, the style of uh, how short or long notes are has to be stylistically congruent through the chain. In other words, if you're playing 16th, deca 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 da, and then the H should be da 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 da, and the quarters da 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 da, and the half da da, like for Mozart. So I hear people play Mozart 40, for example, and they'll play la la da 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 Jack's comments go back to what Andy Rossiti was talking about, making sure that the moves you're practicing at slow tempos are what would actually be done at the faster tempo, and that certainly includes note lengths. Now, Ed Barker encourages his students to use visualization when preparing for auditions. There's a, there is a well-known phrase that I always like to use with my students, is when you're, when you're, in the, when you're building your performance, you're, you're, you're getting ready to perform, and you're practicing as if you're performing, what you need to do is you need to imagine that you are, when you're in the practice room, you, you need to imagine or visualize what it's like to be, whether where it is, if it's in an audition, you know, you gotta, you gotta imagine being behind the screen in a darkened hall, uh, you know, having walked down a long hallway first before you uh, played, having to play this audition. You have to imagine that. You have to imagine this from your practice room setting. And then, when you're in the audition or the recital or whatever, you have to imagine that you're back in your practice room. We'll dig more into that concept of imagining you're back in your practice room when we get into people's specific audition routines next episode. It's an interesting conversation to have. How people preparing for auditions can focus on the audition excerpt so intently that it becomes a detriment. Indianapolis Symphony principal bassist Rufong Liu talks about how she finds balance in her preparation. First of all, I don't like to be overplayed, overpracticed, mm -hmm. because things or the, the music or the excerpt tend to get stale if you like overpractice them, in my opinion. So I think you want to have a pretty good balance, keep things balanced. 
if you like running, you should keep on running. You should keep your, you know, stress management is important because it's such a, you know, for some people it's also like a de- life and death. <laughs> right. Because, because you, you you want to get a job, and every one of us has gone through that. I'm pretty sure. So, but if you you know over maybe there will be anxiety issues or something, and then you cannot perform your best. Continuing to exercise is something that many successful auditioners talk about, and. Several also mentioned how beneficial they find working on music that's not on the audition list. Atlanta Symphony principal bassist Colin Corner shares his thoughts on keeping non-audition music in the mix. I always try and keep, you know, other solos and other kind of hard things under my fingers, too. So I'm, you know, just getting around the bass really nicely. And uh, um, I guess I feel like that's... I'm kind of more focused on that, just, you know, really having my, kind of really getting my music, my musical level there, and, and just my technical level there, and it doesn't have to be just working on the music for the audition, and in and, and that month beforehand, you know, you can be kind of working on solos and all sorts of different things. And it keeps you more kind of creatively in the ballpark, so you're not getting burnt out just working on those excerpts, all you know, all the time. You you you're still sort of maturing as a musician and as a player in that in that month beforehand, you know, without having to sort of get burnt out on, you know, just drilling the excerpts over and over again. Michael Hovnanian has a great perspective on this as well. I think. You know, once you could sort of get your fingers around the, the excerpts and stuff, um, which a lot of players can do nowadays, I think rather than sort of beat your head over the excerpts too much, I, I'd say do something, practice something else, you know, or try and figure out what is it that, I, that I'm not doing well. What, you know, what about my playing just generally needs to get better, not the fact that I can't play... Mozart 35 as fast as I want to. So, you know, I'm just going to play that over and over and over and over and over until I can get it faster. So, well, why can't I play it fast? Is, is it the shifting? Is it the bow? You know, what is it? So try and break it down. Then work on, on something, you know, either scales or etudes or string crossing exercises. Sort of try and boil it down to the, the essentials, I guess, um, I would say. And I think that tends to make the practicing more efficient too, I think, um, so that when you come to the excerpt, you have a little more spontaneity, and then you bring sort of a fresher approach to it, rather than just you know it's like oh my god I played this <laughs> so you know because you're going to have to play it a million times anyway. So almost try and stay away from it just a little bit uh, would be my advice. So slow practice recording playing in a large space, visualization, finding ways to alleviate stress, and continuing to practice other music. All of these have been mentioned time and time again by successful auditioners, and I hope that they help you in your preparation as well. Next episode, we'll follow along with several musicians through their entire audition preparation cycle, from the moment they got the list to the moment they walked on stage. And thank you so much for checking out this episode, and we'll see you next time here on Winning the Audition from Contrabass Conversations. <laughs>